should probably introduce myself as well. Um, so my name is Ben, I'm a postdoctoral researcher in, at Leuven University. I'm a member of MDRM, which organizes the conference. Uh, and basically I work on two topics, two themes, um, all the new theories of reading. Um, and on the other hand, the tension you could say between consumerism and anti-consumerism, which is where ecology comes in, obviously. I'm going to turn this around. I don't have a text, so I'm going to have to use the PowerPoint myself. Okay, so the title has slightly changed. Um, it is now Curious Confusions of Time, the Deep Presence of Jaquetta Hawkes' Exomodernism. Um, you have the email address right there. Um, if you have any, if you detect any fundamental flaws, please uh, let me know. Um, okay, by introduction, um, I would like to introduce you to a beginning politician, and his name is John. Now, at a certain point, John is walking along the beach, and he finds a curious piece of green glass, a very strange piece of glass, and it so fascinates him that he starts to look for other objects, other strange things, broken pieces, like a broken piece of china that he finds. And he continues, the story continues, and then he finds a strange piece of iron, a very strange piece of iron. And I'll continue. And he, he gets so fascinated by these objects that ultimately he neglects his official duties. And his career as a politician ultimately disintegrates. And you could say that he ends up as broken as the pieces of china and the piece of glass <laughs> that ultimately he was so fascinated, that at the beginning he was so fascinated with. Of course, I am recounting the story Solid Objects by Virginia Woolf, which is in her 1944 collection A Haunted House and Other Stories, most famously analysed perhaps, or at least most recently, by Bill Brown in The Secret Life of Things, where he um, offers a sort of material culture object studies perspective on solid objects. Now his argument is that the story is ultimately, quote, about the domestic crisis of wartime scarcity in London and the post-war industrial crisis by the British commitment to free trade. You could say that this, um, in his view, the piece of green glass ultimately refers, glass was characteristically green if it was English glass, so it's about glass scarcity in Britain, he says. Broken China, in Brown's reading, refers to anxieties about the mechanical production of China, specifically Wedgwood China, this sort of um, mechanically perfect China that is ultimately sort of disquieting in its perfection. And then finally, the strange piece of iron in Brown's reading refers to the dwindling export of English iron at the time. So it's really, this material culture perspective, is really about the proximate past, you could say. It's about a very contemporary sort of uh, context. Now, I've mentioned that this strange piece of iron is very strange indeed, and I'd like to return to that. And this is the passage from Wolf. It was almost identical with the glass in shape, massy and globular, but so cold and heavy, so black and metallic, that it was evidently alien to the earth and had its origin in one of the dead stars, or was itself the cinder of a moon? It weighed his pocket down, it weighed the mantelpiece down, it radiated coal. Now this is a very strange sort of object, and Brown recognises that, and in all fairness, he does speak about a different sort of aspect, a different sort of dimension of this um, piece of iron. He says that the passage shows how such a, possession, such a possession might change the scale of one's historical imagination, how the cosmological might insinuate itself into the everyday. It suggests that the distant past is present, as a kind of surface with which we can make intimate contact. Okay, so returning, material culture perspective, this story, it's all about the proximate past. But as Brown himself suggests, it could also be read in terms of how the cosmological might insinuate itself into the everyday. And in fact, Brown does not mention this, but if you start to look for these other references about the cosmological, other sort of interesting things appear. First of all, John, this politician, the ill-fated politician, is also interested at the beginning in the smooth oval egg of a prehistoric bird. And the glass, the piece of green glass from the very beginning, the story emphasizes that it has been smoothed for so long by the sea that it has lost all shape and form, which suggests a very long period of time. And, and he also refers to a precious stone, but I won't go into that. And the other interesting thing, Brown mentions glass, he mentions china, he mentions iron, but not the other material that, according to the story, John is interested in namely amber, which is of course most famous for its ability to trap traces of the very, very distant past. You could say that material culture is not just about the proximate past, but it's also about a deeper past. Okay, so that was the introduction of objects. Uh, I, I would now like to talk about Mark McGill's big historicism, which is basically method, and then I'm going to apply that to Jaquita Hawkes' exomodernism. Okay, uh, in recent years, and this neatly ties into Andy's um, and his lecture, and he mentioned that I invited him, which sort of, you know, it would have been nicer if he did it, so there would be this sort of fortuitous uh, connection. Anyway, um, various critics have been claiming that we should pay closer attention to scale, and I could include Timothy Morton here as well, uh, for ecological reasons, um, as, for instance, in a book, Telemorphosis, 
which is about theory in the age of climate change, in the era of climate change, sorry, um, refer to the new questions posed by climate change. And I think the most significant or more, most systematic radical interpretation or um, claim on behalf of this um, larger sense of scale um, that we can find that in the work of Mark Wigel and Waichi Dimok. Uh, Waichi Dimok, in through other continents, has sort of introduced or reintroduced the geological notion of deep time that Annie already mentioned, and said that we can do all sorts of interesting stuff with that idea when we turn to literature. Now, Mark McGill has been developing that in a series of articles, and I'll be explaining each of these strange terms in a minute, uh, but this is sort of to get a brief overview of the different layers in the argument. He wants to take a look at scale, at deep time. This is sort of the subject, the topic that he wants to investigate. And the method we need to do that, he says, is not new historicism, but big historicism. He also calls it cultural geology. And if we take a big historicist type of approach to literature, what we find is a specific type of corpus, a specific genre, that he calls the post-human comedy. And ultimately, the effect of big historicism is that we need to recalibrate some of the literary historical categories that we are you know, familiar with, like modernism and postmodernism. We should replace that with exomodernism. A lot of terminology and all uh, return to each of them uh, as follows. Now this is all from um, one of the articles by McGill, The Post-Human Comedy, where he begins by um, quoting a section from a creative writing handbook. The section says, you know, that human character is in the foreground of all fiction, however the humanity might be disguised. Even if it's an alien, it's really bad. Anthropomorphism is a literary necessity. Mark McGill doesn't agree. And that is why he introduces the term post-human comedy. This is, he says, a critical fiction meant to draw together a number of modern literary works in which scientific knowledge of the spatio-temporal vastness and numerousness of the non-human world becomes visible as a form of representational and finally existential problem. It is a term, he says, for the appearance of the problem of scale in modern literary history. And he's mainly, in that article, he's mainly interested in horror and science fiction writing. If you want to take a very, very long view and think in terms of, you know, thousands and thousands and millions of years, the natural side, according to McGill, is, you know, forms of genre fiction. But I'm not afraid to, you know, think big. And he also connects this to objects. In another um, essay, he says that, you know, the central idea here is to take non-human objects as seriously as possible, specifically things like the obdurate rock, as an image of the non-human thing, the thing that does not care, and has been not caring for longer than anyone can remember. Mm -hmm. Which is, again, you know, about deep time. It has been caring for, for longer than anyone can remember. Again, the object encapsulates this sort of deeper past, not the proximate. Okay, I think this is a very fruitful sort of suggestion. Um, you know, it sheds new light on you know, mentions of volcanoes, mountains, fossils, all sorts of things. And I'll um, return to that in my analysis. McGill and Dimock have applied it to genre, thing, genre fiction. Sorry. Uh, things like H.P. Lovecraft and Star Trek. For those of you who like Star Trek, very fascinating analysis. Um, but it has also been applied to literary fiction by McGill and Dimock. And I've recently tried to apply it to Dutch literature as well. Um, hopefully in interesting ways, but we'll see what people think. Um, and you can also apply, of course, to film. Uh, there are numerous examples. Um, Cave of Forgotten Dreams by Werner Herzog. I haven't mentioned that. But you also have The Tree of Life, Beasts of the Southern Wild, if some of you um, have seen these films. You have all these sort of interesting passages where deep time intervenes. This is perhaps, for those of you who've seen the Malik film, I'm not sure, has anyone seen the Malik film? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, you should have seen it. Yeah, really. um, it, it's a, it's, it seems like a fairly, well, for Malik at least, like a fairly standard story of about the 1950s, family, about growing up, about memories, so it seems to be a fairly limited sort of temporal scale. But you have a, a very weird sequence in the middle of the film uh, where you have a couple of dinosaurs, and it goes on for five or six minutes, and it seems completely strange. You have, you have all these nature shots in Malik films, so it's not that strange. But again, you have this sort of a vast scale that is introduced in the midst of a very, very tiny story, you could say. And this is the, the part where, you know, one of the dinosaurs pins the other down, and you, you expect something, you know, didn't fight, he's going to eat it, but he just, he leaves, and nothing really happens. It's a very strange sort of, we could return to that um, if you have any interesting remarks, we could, you know, interesting passage. Now, Wachi Demok, as, um, you know, as critics tend to do, responded to Martin Girl and says, you know, that this is all very interesting, but it's all very wrong, <laughs> sort of typical. Um, what he says is, how do we wrap our minds around the big historicism that renders our lives negligible? And what she basically says is, you know, this is, this is actually quite disquieting. If we take the very long view, then we're simply irrelevant. So why would we want to do that? This is, you know, it leads to unsettling nihilism, you could say, in the face of inevitable human extinction. You know, when, when the planet will ultimately disintegrate, um, or the, will collapse into the sun. Like um, now, she says, well, this is not really a problem. Deep time, it sounds scary, but ultimately we're fine. And we're fine because of two reasons. First of all, 
post-human comedy and stuff like that, it's actually not very new. This is what Epic does. You know, it confronts you with alien orders of magnitude. Additionally, she says, the human brain is quite capable of you know, accommodating these very large-scale, non-anthropocentric reaches of time, you could say. You know, we have sort of shock-absorbing mechanisms, and we can accommodate these uh, vast reaches. And she says, it's true, a new canon of American literature could be built around this paradox of size, you're right, Mark, not blind to the long delay of astronomy and geology, however, keeping it at bay, judiciously rescaled to allow our brains to keep on doing what evolution has equipped us to do. For instance, through anecdote, or through poetic form. You know, we have these millions and millions of years to write a sonnet, and then it is rescaled immediately. And this is what the human brain does. The girl, of course, has to respond as well. He says, you're right. All literature is a kind of scaling device, but I am mainly interested in works of literature where you know literature runs into its limits. Where really, where you have this sort of representational problem: how can we, you know, accommodate this sort of large-scale um, temporal frame? And then he says that post-human comedy is produced in the effort, both cheerful and annihilating, to project inhuman quantities onto a plane equal with contemporary life, which is sort of a synthesis, right? It's cheerful. This is the Dimock version, you could say. It's not really a problem, but also annihilating, which is really the original uh, McGill. Uh, and this is the final uh, methodological uh, remark that I want to make, the literary historical implications. McGill says that big historicism is actually a post-postmodern idea. They have a very long quote, but it's very relevant to this conference. So here we go. This is as much to say that there has always been something residually humanist in the postmodern. But it is also to admit upfront that this challenge is already, as it were there, as a latency in the postmodern. In fact, already there in the discourse of the modern, whose narrative of the progressive domination of nature by science has long been ironized by the discovery of the bizarrely humiliating length of geologic time and the relative puniness of the human. The term I would apply to this not newness, the exit of the modern, positions itself strategically outside rather than after the modern and postmodern. A projection of post humanist thinking into the cultural realm, exit modernism is not so much a period or school as a name for the glimpses we hallucinate in various cultural works of the unincorporated remainder of the work of all periods and schools. So basically, this, this seems like, and McGill has been doing it, and other people have been doing this for some time, it seems like a very fruitful idea to apply to modernism and to other forms of literature as well. Um, additionally, but this might take too long to explain, um, if, it, if it doesn't make sense to speak about a postmodern, it makes more sense to speak about exomodern. Maybe we shouldn't speak about posthumanism as well. Like, the chronological post doesn't make much sense in my view either. But okay, this has been a very long methodological introduction. <laughs> but there will be a payoff. <laughs> Okay, Jaqueta Hawkes is exomodernist. Uh, who is Jaqueta Hawkes? There you go. <laughs> Sitting on a rock. Um, you know, as you would expect in a presentation on rocks and literature. You know, this is Jaqueta Hawkes. Now, who is Jaqueta Hawkes and why would we want to study Jaqueta Hawkes in this context? Um, she was an archaeologist, a writer. Uh, she did a lot of work on science popularization. Uh, she was part of the Festival of Britain in 1951, for those of you who are never and are interested in. She wrote a lot of interdisciplinary books. The most famous one that I'll be talking about is A Land, A Land, 1951. It was a bestseller at the time, and it has recently been reissued. Uh, and she also co-wrote books, um, particularly with her second husband, J.B. Priestley, who was a playwright. And I'll, I'll, I'll briefly mention this in the code at the end, Journey Down a Rainbow of 1955. She was friends with lots of interesting, important people from the modernist era, um, particularly Henry Moore, as I'll be returning to Henry Moore briefly at the end. Uh, why would we want to study Hawkes in this context? First of all, post-human comedy, low epic, call it what you will. You also have this in non-fiction, obviously. Uh, and Jacqueta Hawkes has been generally overlooked as, well, as the secondary literature mentioned, which is strange. It has been overlooked. There is some secondary literature, but okay. Uh, but it mostly, the existing literature is mostly about context, um, not really about the stuff that I'm interested in. Uh, and this allows me, uh, Hawkes is a very good example because it allows me to show, and you know, think about the uh, solid objects from the beginning, how deep time is present in everyday objects as well, how it's present in material culture as well. Um, and I'll say something about consumption and deep time at the end. Okay, this is the land, and here you have a, a, an interesting sort of summary, um, a review in The Guardian um, of the reissue of Hawkes' book. It appears at different points to be a short history of planet England, a geological prose poem, a Cretaceous cosmic comedy, a patriotic hymn of love to Terra Britannica. A neo-romantic vision of the countryside as a vast and inadvertent work of land art, a speculative account of human identity as tonic in origin and collective in nature, a homily aimed at rousing us from spiritual torpor, a lusty pagan lullaby of longing, and a Jeremiah against centralization, industrialization, and our severance from the land. Very strange book, um, interdisciplinary in nature, as you can already see. Well, lots could be said about it, but I'll only be um, focusing on a number of uh, issues. Now, it's sort of a um, natural case study to look at if you're interested in, in deep time, because 
one of the things that she, she mentions literature a lot, and some of the things that she does with literature sound remarkably similar to the things that you know, people like Martin Girl have been saying. Here you have an excerpt from Husbands of Shropshire Lad. Um, on Renwick Edge, the wood's in trouble, to blow like this, to halt and hang, etc. When you're upon the city stood. Uh, and it's basically, if you, I won't read all of it, um, you have this sort of, someone is standing in the forest, and he thinks, ah, this is the same wind that has annoyed the Romans. So you have this sense of, you know, a deeper time. You know, it's not just about, um, you know, what Hausmann or what the poetic narrow. No, it's also about a deeper sense of time. But not deep enough. Here is to get a horse. The limestones forming Wenlock Edge preserve for us an idyllic peaceful moment. The brittle elegance of life around coral leaves in shallow sun irradiated seas. The corals and sea lilies have been held there just as they grew. There is, I think, something pleasing in this vision of the sober English countryside, in the woods on Wenlock Edge stirring painfully deep in the poet's mind, while below the surface of the land and of time, this tropical world was standing motionless. So, you know, literature has missed this sort of even deeper time, which is very similar to what um, people like McGill have been saying. Um, and so you could say that in a land you have this sort of combination of what McGill and Dimock say, you know, this sort of cheerful, we can accommodate deep time, we're fine, and also the more uh, disquieting dimension. On one hand, you can, this is the cheerful option, you can humanize the past, this is a quote from the beginning. Modern men enjoy a unity with trilobites of a nature more deeply significant. Um, and she mentions poets and painters there as well. So there is a unity. You know, we're fine. But you also have these more um, annihilating, more disquieting elements where she defamiliarizes the present, where the strangeness of the past, you could say, still lingers. The land we all walk upon has been under the sea many times, and it will be submerged again. I found that disquieting. Um, <clears throat> Okay, now I want to take a look at a number of strategies where you have this combination of um, the cheerful and the annihilating, you could say. Um, first of all, point of view. This is, um, you have lots of passages where she tries to imagine what it's like to be, for instance, a Stegosaurus. <laughs> As for the consciousness centered in the Stegosaurus as it, it must have registered the sharp outline of the dragonflies and leaves, the rich smell of the lagoon, and the squelching and splashing of other dinosaurs feeding in mud and shallow water. Fleeting, uncoordinated images like the projection of transparencies on drifting clouds, which is really where she enters the head of the Stegosaurus, right, at the end. And she also mentions media, which I'll return to in a minute. Um, the other thing, and Andy again was there first, um, is time-lapse narratives. It's something that returns a number of times. Time-lapse photography, you have a number of names there uh, that were responsible for sort of introducing that technology. Uh, it's the reverse of slow motion. Um, so things go, go very, very, very fast. Um, and here I had an interesting GIF image inserted, but I don't trust PowerPoint, so I made a PDF, and now the GIF is gone, of course. Okay. What you actually have, this is one of the, uh, Google released this a couple of months ago, I'm not sure, um, and here you have the retreat of the Columbia Glacier, and it, it's supposed to, you know, be 1984, 1993, up until 2011, of course, the glacier was retreated. So this is time-lapse photography, where you have a very, you could look at that for like five seconds, and you'd have the entire retreat for that period, so it goes very, very fast. Now, what happens in Jaquetta Hawks is something very similar, but in verbal form. Uh, and this is sort of the representational challenge. Why does she do this? Because of stuff like this. I like, I like to think of the seas which are forming, clouded with white as though from a snowstorm, a fall that lasted for 30 million years and later a depth of 1,000 feet. How the, how the hell do you represent something like that? And this is what she says, and she refers actually to time and photography. There are nature films that show the opening of a flower in a shorter time as it takes a woman to get out of bed. I remember, I remember too seeing a French film in which the time was so much hastened that the evening hour passed in a minute and darkness fell visibly. But the camera can be made to do so smoothly, I in this chapter must attempt clumsily with words. This history should not be described as a series of stills, such as are shown in geological textbooks. If only some powerful cine camera, yes, if only, if only some powerful cine camera could long ago have been set up on the moon. By running through its record at tremendous speed, it would be possible to apprehend the movements of land and sea as a continuous process. Um, and this is, this is, here, is she, here she is talking about time-lapse photography. These are two passages uh, where she uses that sort of strategy itself. If the movement of the Earth's crust could be speeded up, as in a cinematograph, we should see a rise and fall as though of breathing. Sort of interesting reference, I'm not sure, the earlier panel. I don't think the speaker was here. This is also about breathing. A very strange type of reference to breathing. And with the foreshortening of time, the huge prehistoric forest can be seen as a black wave sweeping in the wake of the retreating whiteness of the ice, etc. Again, you have a sort of time-lapse narrative where the vast reaches of time are compressed to make them, you know, humanly, um, um, that you can process them. 
Um, literature is mentioned as well. In fact, some of the sections read like a sort of alternative literary history, where she tries to you know, trace the legacy or the relationship between um, humans and rocks and the earth. And we have these mentions of Beowulf all the way to Proust and, and to others. Um, she also suggests that literature provides access to deep time. Well, here you have two examples. When I think of the Triassic Seas, all you need to do is think of Coleridge, and you're there. Literature provides access to deep time. I am reminded of the ancient mariner and see them. You immediately see them if you recall the scene from uh, the ancient mariner. And then you have a very similar passage um, involving Irilka, which I won't read. Um, oh, that's, that's right. So literature um, provides access to deep time. Now, the main point, and this is sort of the, the, the gist of what I was saying, is that deep time is everywhere. Throughout the book, you have all these references to contemporary artifacts, the things that we all know. And what she suggests is, Deep time is present in these, you know, everyday things. Salt, coal. Gold is not everyday. But, you know. um, stones, chalk in the classroom. All this is very, very old. All this is deep time, really. Uh, crowns, gravestones. To use that, to do that, you need stones. You need uh, very, very old objects. This leads to an awareness of the longer now. I seem to see it through geological time, as she says. And you also find that in art. And I'll return to local craft at the end, not right here. She said that what happens in the sculpture of Henry Moore, for instance, is very similar. You have this sort of evocation of deep time. And um, for those of you who don't, um, these are some of the sculptures by Henry Moore, the sort of quasi-abstract, quasi-figurative, uh, very interesting. Um, well, the sculpture, very famous sculpture, of course. Um, and this is what she says to get a horse. This is why Moore often chooses a stone from the Elias that is full of fossils, all of which make their statement when exposed by his chisel. So what the sculptor is doing is really he's unearthing the, si the signs of deep time from the rocks that surround us. Sort of very similar project to what Hawks herself is doing and what happens in the post-human comedy uh, or in the epic. Okay, um, and now three passages where this sort of, um, which summarize this, this sort of argument. It is curious to think that granite and basalt, the of water and early atmosphere of Earth, have made all the material paraphernalia with which man now surrounds himself. The skyscraper, the wine glass, the vacuum cleaner, the jewels, the mirror into which I look. And the woman who looks, where did it come from? So again, this suggestion, you know, material culture, it's not just about the proximate past. And here you have this type, this explains the type. When as a very small child I was playing with a horse tail that had been growing as a weed, dismantling it, etc., I remember how my father told me it was one of the oldest planets on the earth, and I experienced a curious confusion of time. I was holding the oldest planet in my hand, and so I too was, was old. Now huge horse tails are growing, and then she immediately segs into this description of a very, very old scene. You know, she's holding the plant, and then immediately she's there in the very, very distant past, this curious confusion of time. Now finally, we have a scene that is reminiscent of the scene I began with, in Virginia Woolf's Solid Objects, where we encounter a meteorite. And she describes, you know, she, she goes to the Geological Muse Museum, we have many jagged lumps of matter, meteorites really, we have pure iron, pure stone, and then a mix, and these shooting stars are chips from globes, very much like our own. They are, as the label states, fragments of former worlds, but again, very old worlds, obviously. So what I want, we want to suggest, actually, is that the reference to iron, for instance, the solid objects by Virginia Woolf, could not only be interpreted in terms of iron shortages or a dwindling export, but also in terms of, you know, sort of disquieting uh, memories of, of deep time, you could say. Okay, okay. Um, as I mentioned, Hawks and Priestley wrote a book together called Journey Down the Rainbow, very interesting, very um, fascinating, outdated, but very fascinating book. Well, what, what happens is Chiquita Hawks goes to, um, they both go to south, southwest of America, and Chiquita Hawks goes to the Pueblos, and J.B. Priestley goes to the largest cafeteria in the world, and stuff like that. So, consumerism, very, very contemporary stuff, and Chiquita Hawks goes to these oldest, the prehistoric people. Uh, and you have lots of interesting passages, uh, like this one, uh, where she goes to sort of museum, store, it's not really, it's not really certain what, what it is. They're as elegantly displayed as they could be in the most exclusive boutique with six woven strips in perfect condition. They were found in a dry cave where they had been lying for some 1,500 years. There would be nothing of its kind half so good in New York, London, or Paris. So it's like the ultimate object because it's very old and you can trust it immediately with um, the things that are available in exclusive boutiques. Okay, that was my presentation. Thank you very much.